on Saturday morning, June 17th, when I was called to go to the courthouse, if somebody had said, you are embarking on a road that is going to take two years and two months, going to lead to President Nixon's resignation, I would have laughed and said, that's impossible. The work of Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein changed the course of American politics and with it American history and it inspired a generation of journalists. I can't tell you how many journalism conferences I've been to where they have shown all the president's men at some point during a conference because they wanted to have the journalists kind of re-energized about what they can accomplish. It was inspiring to see how journalists could uncover such a complicated political scandal and realizing that people who were sort of leading the charge in this story weren't really much older than, than some of us in college. The reason that Woodward and Bernstein were an inspiration to so many journalists was that they worked the story. I mean, they worked it day and night. They worked it the old-fashioned way. There's no question that uh, Watergate and the coverage by the Post uh, strengthened considerably the press and the nation. It showed that with courage you could do the role that we all felt that journalism should do. The power of the press in the Watergate era looms even larger when seen through the prism of today's very different media environment. The Watergate era coming out of the 60s, and it was before the 80s where media consolidation really began, uh, was a high point for investigative journalism. I think what Woodward and Bernstein did was just radically change uh, journalism in American politics, primarily, I think, for the good. American politics was always defined by what you might call the Walter Winchell effect, the well-known journalist before their time who really made a name for himself by being very cozy with people in positions of authority and power. What Woodward and Bernstein really did was act more as guardians of the American government, which is something that the system needed. I give the management and ownership of the Washington Post full credit for accepting near all the threats that the administration applied to them. They made every threat they could think of to try to silence the Washington Post. Catherine Graham inherited this paper when her husband died. We'd been through the Pentagon Papers together and we had a relationship where I expected her to support me and uh, she was so supportive of the newsroom you can't believe it. Down here every all three or four times a day on a, on a good day. At the end of Watergate, journalism schools were filled with people who wanted to be investigative reporters, wanted to be Woodward and Bernstein. And in fact, it got kind of trite uh, that regular reporters were suddenly the investigative journalists of their newspaper rather than just another one of the people out off the city desk. I thought they should be doing that job anyway. I'm not uh, a reporter who thinks that uh, so-called investigative journalism necessarily is different from the rest of, of journalism. It seems to me that all good uh, reporting is pretty much the same thing, the best obtainable version of the truth. Obviously that applies perhaps a bit more to what we call in quotes investigative journalism. I do hope that the aggressiveness that came in those days of investigative journalism, unquote, is still uh, there in the city rooms. Uh, and I, I believe that for the most part it is. To examine the impact of Woodward and Bernstein in the Watergate case, the obvious question is, could it happen now? For two journalists to find a crime of potentially national significance Nowadays, it would be very difficult to keep that story focused, and I think it would be very difficult to keep that story from being overwhelmed by the reaction of the Internet and by other people who might be successful really in, in sort of shooting down the story. I think today there might be a, a much better chance at success of moving attention away from the story. People are so inundated today with information that it's kind of hard for them to sort of separate the wheat from the chaff. They don't really know 
what's real and what's not after, after a while. There is a new media configuration, particularly with talk TV, that enables a president and his men uh, to dictate uh, the media agenda to an extent that the Nixon White House eventually was unable to do. You remember the part of the movie where Woodward and Bernstein make a mistake about testimony in front of the grand jury? Why is the Post trying to do it? All I know is that the story that ran this morning is incorrect and has been so uh, stated as being incorrect by not only me, but by the individual whose secret grand jury testimony they based their story on. They were criticized at the time for that, but imagine what the conservative bloggers would do today if they made a mistake. They would have been rocked back on their heels, maybe even pulled off the story. The pressure would be much more intense because as, as much partisanship as we had during Watergate, and there was a lot, there's even more now. The media today, much of it, is heavily into self-censorship. They do not pursue stories that they do not believe will be popular with their readers or viewers, particularly television. Television is about offending the fewest because it's about filling the seats. In television, it's necessary to remember that the product is not the program. The product is the audience and the consumer is the advertiser. In the years since Watergate, we've seen media companies get swallowed by a bigger fish and get swallowed by an even bigger fish and get swallowed by a whale until you have corporations covering other corporations. And the tricky thing about investigative journalism is that it's a risk. If you put money, resources, time, energy into investigating a story, a reporter can come back empty-handed. And that doesn't pass the cost-benefit test in America's corporate boardrooms. I would imagine one danger would be that the corporations that own the media would be far more uh, hesitant to, be, uh, to challenge the president, to be sued, to be run out of business, to have their license revoked because a lot of the uh, people who own the print obviously own radio and television licenses and those licenses are come up for review and so forth and it's a dirty ball game it's a corrupt ball game as we all know when i began as a journalist most of the major cities had at least two papers uh, in some in some cases three uh, competing every day for for stories and i think that a lot of that competition uh, really sort of sharpen the skills of people in terms of getting good good stories, solid stories, and informing the public. There was a time when there were more than 7,000 daily newspapers in my newspaper career, and there were probably 16, 1,700 daily newspapers. So there were just fewer papers to play with investigative reporting. The decline of newspaper readership and the rise of television news and the birth of cable and all of a sudden you have 500 channels and you have 24-hour news that changed everything about news. If Watergate happened now, Woodward and Bernstein, I'm convinced, would be subpoenaed to appear before a federal grand jury investigating Watergate uh, and asked to reveal their sources. They would not have done so. They would have gone to jail to protect Deep Throat and as a result, they would have been out of action not writing stories for the Washington Post, and that scandal probably wouldn't have come out. So if Watergate happened today, for several reasons, it probably wouldn't be exposed, which is kind of scary. I would like to think that the New York Times, the Washington Post, other substantial newspapers would stand by their reporters and do what Ben did in the Watergate situation. But I don't know. None of them have had to face quite as serious a uh, consequence uh, of any 